Okay, this is Michael Saltzman from Blue Sky Bio. I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining us for tonight's webinar presentation. This is the sixth or seventh presentation in the 2018 webinar series. You could check past presentations. They're available on blueskyplan.com and on YouTube. You could view and watch the recorded presentations, and you could see the upcoming schedule as well on blueskyplan.com. We've had a lot of exciting things going on from Blue Sky Bio. We've come out recently with a better release of a new denture module in the Blue Sky Plan software, in addition to a new crown and bridge module in the Blue Sky Plan software. We've added many new implant systems to the surgical guide module as well. And we'll be rolling out some important ortho updates and many other new features and functionalities coming out in the, new, in the near future. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box and we'll see if we can get them addressed during the presentation. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Michael Scherer, a really an international educator and lecturer and innovator in the field of dental technology. And we'll be hearing him presenting on the topic of simple workflows for challenging cases. Dr. Scherer. Michael, thank you very much. Um, for everybody tuning in here, it, uh, it's an esteemed honor and privilege to be able to host and uh, be a part of this webinar. And I give special thank you to Michael and Blue Sky Bio for, for having me. Uh, this will be more or less uh, not necessarily a bleeding edge type presentation, uh, very much like some of the other esteemed speakers that have presented this year. Uh, however, this will be kind of a more fundamental what I do in my clinical practice uh, with a little sprinkling of some of that cutting edge, possibly bleeding edge, depending upon what your experience level in this technology has been. Um, just because the vast majority of the treatment that I do is really pretty boring. And I always like to say that a boring surgery is a good surgery. And what happens is, is that the technology of the Blue Sky Plan software in combination with the, the implants and also the entire suite of technology that Blue Sky Bio brings to the page allows me to facilitate the implant procedures and to make it as boring as possible. And I know it's somewhat humorous to put it that way, but it is absolutely true. The less suspense and the less excitement that I have during surgery, the better. And how we get there is, of course, well, just a quick introduction about me, uh, but how we get there is starting with some of those key fundamentals. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. I am a full-time private practice clinician in Northern California, about two hours to the east of San Francisco. Uh, I practice uh, about four, four and a half days a week, depending upon the week, uh, but I am full-time in clinical practice and know many of the trials and tribulations that many of you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And in fact, also, I, I have teaching positions at two institutions, and uh, I'm a board-certified prosthodontist. Quick disclosure, uh, any of the information companies or products that I'm talking about in today's webinar is not endorsed by either of those institutions. And first and foremost as well, uh, Blue Sky Bio uh, recommends the use of a CBCT scan and or a laboratory desktop scanner to produce STL files for surgical fabrication. The use of intraoral scanner and STL files for intraoral scanning is not an approved aspect of the Blue Sky Pan software. This is something that I do as myself as a clinician, not representative of the company. Certainly without a doubt, uh, it gives me great pleasure to acknowledge Blue Sky Bio in being able to support this webinar and to have such an incredible company and to be able to provide what I feel is the most captivating and powerful comb beam software uh, in existence. Uh, and it's such an amazing software. I literally use it probably four hours a day. Um, no joke. It's just I'm addicted to the software. So thank you for the team and everybody that is tuning in that helped contribute to the software. Uh, a little bit of also further background about me, uh, something that I do uh, fully embrace is the stuff that you see in this presentation. I uh, had a full-time teaching position at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where we took the dental students, people that I was always told throughout my career in academics as well as in private practice, people that quote unquote, cannot use digital technology. Uh, when I went through dental school and then through residency, we were barely able to touch Combeam CT. 
And when I came on board at UNLV, uh, we took the dental students and got them to the point where that was integrated as part of their curriculum, CBCT treatment planning, imaging. And at the time, we were using an automage in vivo software. Uh, but nowadays, uh, they're using a combination of an automage as well as Blue Sky Plan, where they are actually digitally treatment planning all these cases. And the core fundamentals of a lot of the things that we learn in school ring true. Even though we constantly seek out CE and education to be able to further our skills, it is not such an unusual thing to think back to what we've learned in school and build upon those core fundamentals. And funny enough, I still practice my private practice very much like I did back in school and in residency, and I still maintain an extremely productive clinical practice. Um, the core fundamentals of what we learn in the educational world ring true. And also for some additional resources for this presentation, I encourage you to check out first and foremost, the Blue Sky Bio user group. Incredible things happen on the Facebook group. I know many of you that are tuned into this presentation are members there, but if you're not, I encourage you to check it out. There's really visionary things that happen on there almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Certainly you can check out my website, michaelsheerdmd.com. I have uh, approximately 32 publications that you're welcome to go check out, um, and many of those on cone beam imaging. And I am up to five YouTube channels as well, so you're welcome to go check out those YouTube channels. And certainly, if you have any questions you wanted to follow up uh, that we can't cover during the question and answer session of this presentation, uh, send me an email. I'm happy to respond. Some of the concepts we'll be talking about, some of the fundamentals, um, were seated in the foundation with this article that I wrote back in 2014 for Dental Clinics in North America. If you go to my website, you can download that or you can go to the, um, the Dental Clinics in North America and download the article there. Uh, it's approximately 30 pages of goodies and different practical things that we use in co imaging, core fundamentals of Im implant treatment planning, um, and it's really been pretty widely recognized as a, as a good key contribution to the literature. Uh, but a lot of the things that we'll be talking about here uh, are in this article, but many, many contemporary things that I've done ever since publishing that. And certainly just as a quick little plug and a thank you, uh, if you're interested in some additional uh, either one-on-one -on -one learning at our courses here in California, uh, or we have a uh, completely online course at uh, FastTrackDentalCE.com, approximately 30 hours of video-based step-by-step education. Um, where an entire section will be covering uh, comb beam CT imaging, how to work with it in various techniques, and goes into the advanced stuff as well, full arch guides and working with multiple 3D printers. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the core fundamentals of where we need to start with when we think about 3D workflows and image fusion technology. Where we are currently, the established workflow is making some sort of optical or CBCT image. And the optical or CBCT image, regardless of what CBCT imaging you use, regardless of what optical scanner you use, is going to generate some sort of STL or a similar file as STL. Happens to be STL is just the most common file that we use in 3D imaging and dentistry and most engineering tasks. The reason is, is, is that once we go ahead and image, either with photons from a CBCT or with images from a desktop or intraoral scanner, it's going to be able to give us the power to be able to create this file. And historically, we've done that quite a bit by taking this file and then fusing it directly to a comb beam CT. And this is just showing you the classic approach. This particular guide was an anatomage guide, one that was, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And I've been using guided surgery for, oh, approximately 13 years or so, give or take, um, ever since the Nobel Guide days and, and Simplant and Materialize. And what I found was, is, is that as we started to mature a little bit in comium imaging, we started to realize the potential of what can be done with CBCT 3D imaging. And the power of this is, is that it really branches beyond what we do with our single tooth guides or with our uh, essentially very standardized guides. We'll be going into a brief touch of some of the advanced concepts, but the key today is, is how do we leverage the optical or the images generated of the teeth and how do we better adapt them to our 3D images generated from photons? So the old traditional way of doing it is to go ahead and make an alginate impression then go ahead and say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and send you to the imaging center. 
I would send my patient to the imaging center and then all of a sudden they'd come back a few weeks later, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the old way is really fine. There's nothing wrong with doing it this way. It clearly works. And this is absolutely a much better way to practice implant dentistry than just to say, you know what, I'm going to make some guesses. I'm just going to use a, a simple pano or a periapical radiograph to place implants. And while it's, you know, certainly being discussed at the national and state level, in my own practice, my standard of care is CBCT imaging for implant dentistry. I just will not place a dental implant without a CBCT. And I'm rapidly evolving in my practice where I just do not place an implant without a surgical guide. So once my patient said, yes, okay, when can I get started with implant, you know, treatment? You know, typically the answer is how about right now? That's the right answer. Now, the old way is to say, okay, well, that's great. Let's start right now, but we're going to go ahead and make an alginate impression uses a study model, and then we'll walk you up front. We'll go ahead and send you to an imaging center. We have to find out how to set up an appointment there, uh, give the patient the location of the imaging center, find the coordinates, get them coordinated. Then a, a CD-ROM disk would come back with all the files, and then hopefully it was an open DICOM file that I can import into Blue Sky Plan. Sometimes it took several phone calls back and forth. Oh, what a pain. So ultimately, at the end of that first appointment, the patient would be saying, well, how come I have to wait? And I would say, well, that's just the way it is. It was the status quo. However, in my practice, literally almost every day, in fact, just 20 minutes before sitting on this webinar, this is exactly what I was doing. Patient says, when can I get started with implant dentistry or when can I get started with that treatment? I say, how about right now? And the patient says, really? What do you mean? I said, well, I can bring in my little scanner right now make an image, make a scan, take it to our other room where we have another scanner that's going to take another type of 3D scan. And then I'm going to join those together. And within a few moments, I'll know if you're a good candidate for my dental implant treatment. And knowing that the patient knows instantly by the time that they walk to the front desk, or maybe by the time that they're about ready to leave, that they're a good candidate for that particular implant treatment. And this is a really captivating way to practice. Because the old way is, is just to kind of figure out when I can get started with implant dentistry coordinating imaging center versus today. Costs to the patients were variable. When I would go ahead and work with other companies or different systems versus outsourcing versus insourcing, I could control my costs by insourcing. Insourcing the imaging, insourcing the guide production, insourcing the surgery, absolutely. Convenience was highly inconvenient for the patient. Any time that I would have to work with another entity, it was always going to delay my treatment. Versus if I could go ahead and coordinate CBCT imaging, optical imaging with guide production in my office, it creates a simple, fast, and easy modality for me and my patients. And then availability without a doubt. Any time that my office is open, the imaging is uh, available. And then the big for me is the, the X factor. Certainly with my patients, status quo is okay for certain things. However, if I can create amazing experiences for my patients, solidifying my expertise, control my scanning, and giving my patients the ability to say yes more readily, I'm ahead. So the traditional workflow in my office right now is to go ahead and start imaging the patient right away either typically done by myself or done by assistants. When my patient says, when can I get started with implant dentistry? I say, how about right now? The optical scanners moved into my office and or into my operatory. I make the direct image of the patient's dentition, walk away. My assistant takes over from there. My assistant then walks the patient over to the cone beam imaging portion of my um, office, and then the image is made. And then typically what happens is, is that depending upon you and your office, if you have intraoral scanning, that's an opportunity. However, if you're using desktop scanning, which the Shining 3D scanner is a fabulous scanner, or you can make a cone beam image of a stone model, fabulous way to do implant dentistry. Certainly the only thing that you would do is then flip flop those. So instead of this being second, this would be first, then this would be second. Regardless, then what we're going to do is, is we're going to import those two different scans into my Blue Sky Plan software, generate my implant plan, generate my surgical guide, and then 3D print my surgical guide. Then after 3D printing, the patient is then seen for implant procedures. So which is going to segue us into the topic du jour, which is working with those challenging cases, because that's the established workflow for my everyday patients. Now, certainly as a prosthodontist, I work with a lot of challenging patients, people that are heavily restored, people that are missing three quarters of their teeth, or people that have root tips all over the place that are looking for denture solutions. 
I can tell you that from my experience, the general takeaway of today's presentation is that working with challenging cases is actually quite simple. The most challenging cases can be made simple, and it really begins with effective CBCT scans. If you capture your CBCT scan efficiently, effectively, that's going to make the most simple adaptation of that surgical plan. So let's begin this presentation by talking about how we begin with making great CBCT scans. And the key of that is, is we have to do it simply. Because when something is complicated, when it's complex, that's when you start to lose your assistance, your front desk, your systems in your office. And the key is, is, is that what is a simple approach to comium CT imaging? Well, first and foremost, let's figure out what makes a quote ideal cone beam scan. And now I apply this text here at the bottom right for most users. I'll explain in just a bit. As mentioned before, I'm a basically I love boring implant surgery, something that is very predictable. And that really begins by making sure that your scans are accurate and precise. Calibration of a CBCT scanner is something to think about. We don't think about it a lot in implant dentistry workflows especially when we're thinking about comb beam scanning and how it works. But calibration of a comb beam scanner is something that you have to consider. Now, that is manufacturer specific, so we'll talk about that in a moment. Importantly, it is important to have a sufficiently large field of view, good enough to see the proposed implant site and also the contralateral side. I am not a fan of doing a simple quadrant-based comb beam scan for implant treatment plan. I typically am going to scan my patients on a 12 by 9 scan, I want to see enough information to have a proper diagnostic ability. I'm not afraid also of uh, interpreting a CBCT scan. I have the training for it. However, if I was a little bit concerned, if I was a little bit new to comb beam imaging, it is never a bad idea to involve a radiologist. I work extensively with a radiologist at UNLV, Dr. Bob Danforth, and he's certainly available for reading and interpreting scans. If you need his information, reach out to me by email. You need to scan with sufficient voxel size for the task. More on this to come later. If your scanner allows for a metal artifact removal algorithm, I do select that for most of my patients, regardless if they have restorations or not. Importantly, I have to ensure that I have no movement artifacts on my CBCT scan. If I see a movement artifact or a double vision of the scan, I have to correct that right away. So anytime a comb beam scan is made in my office before the patient leaves, I verify that the scan has been done correctly. And I know that's difficult to do for a lot of clinicians that have very busy practices. I can ensure you it is something that can be done. Importantly, minimizing noise and scatter. I'll show you some techniques to do that. Tongue away from the palate. This one is a tricky one just because our assistants are programmed. They think, oh, this machine is meant for panoramics. Oh, I was trained in, in uh, dental assisting school to tell the patient to put the tongue in the roof of their mouth while we do a scan for a pano. Do we want that for a cone beam? We'll cover that in a moment. And then for my scans, nearly 100% of my cone beam scans are made with an open bite during the scan. Now we're going to break each one of these down. CBCT calibration. Many of us aren't aware, but many cone beam scanners need to be calibrated on a regular basis. Why is this important? Well, things can change. As the scanner gets enough use, some of those little parts of the scanner come a little bit off axis. There might be a little bit of a wobble in the machine. Out here in California, we sometimes get earthquakes, so that can also throw off cone beam imaging. Many of your manufacturers have different ways of calibrating your machines. Some need calibration on a very regular basis. Other machines auto calibrate. So depending upon which cone beam machine, it's important to ask your distributor or with your manufacturer, what sort of calibration, if any, needs to be done. The field of view is very important for us to consider. As mentioned before, I recommend choosing the appropriate field of view for each indication or scan. You have to weigh less radiation dose versus having to make a second scan for a missed structure. Typically, most implant scans, from my experience, are made in a medium field of view. Now, this is true of my practice and also many times from when I work with other clinicians with cone beam imaging. And you can see here, medium field of view is going to be typically one of these two right in here, typically capturing the entire maxilla and mandible structures all in one. I can't tell you how many times I see one of these smaller fields of view where it's just the mandible captured or just the maxilla. 
Perfectly fine for clinicians if that's within your comfort level. However, I really like to capture the maxilla and mandible at the same time. It minimizes the chance of second scans. It minimizes the chance of error. Yes, it is a slightly increased radiation dose. However, my comb beam scanner has an extremely low effective uh, radiation dose per scan. If you do use an older scanner that has a large effective dose, it is important to recognize how much radiation you are having with your patient. For me, in my opinion, the actual clinical procedure is the most important. Most of the time, most patients really don't necessarily ask, nor do they care what sort of dosage they get, so long as it means it gives them a beneficial outcome for their clinical procedure. So the size options are limited by your combi machine. Certainly, without a doubt, I 100% recommend when anybody's interested in comb beam imaging or purchasing a comb beam scanner, purchase the largest field of view you can afford. And for me, the smallest that I would recommend for myself in my practice or a clinician that does a fair amount of implant surgery is a 12 by 9 or a medium field of view, depending upon your scanner. Typically, I want to see the entire maxilla and mandible at the same time. The field of view selection is made within your comb beam scanner. Your comb beam scanner allows you to dynamically change your field of view. This is the, just this imaging capture within my comb beam scanner, uh, 120 by 85 millimeter or jargony uh, within the industry, 12 by 9. Also, it allows me to change if I wanted to just take an image of an upper right, upper left. The only time that I would really use something that small is if I'm trying to find cracks within teeth or trying to find fractures. And it does work extremely well for that capacity. The voxel size of your scan is important for us to understand with scanning. Voxels are a three-dimensional pixel. Just like many of us are used to understanding the terminology of retina and pixels for our monitors or our home screen TVs, a pixel is a two-dimensional square. A voxel is a three-dimensional square or a cube. So a voxel is a reconstructed series of three-dimensional cubes. When you increase your voxel size, you're going to lower your resolution because an object is made up of a certain number of squares. And if you increase the number of squares, you're going to get higher resolution, just like a retina screen for a Macintosh is going to be a higher resolution than something else because it has a higher DPI. So most resolutions of comb beam scanners are broken down into these categories. We have very high resolution, something less than 0.2 millimeter voxel size or greater or equal to. High resolution is 0.3, normal resolution is 0.4, low resolution is 0.5. Now, this can be variable depending upon how your comb beam scanner is configured. However, that's a general consensus amongst the literature. Again, voxel size and resolution is set within your comb beam scanner. I toggle this within my comb beam scanner by choosing my voxel selection, large, medium, or small. Small would be higher resolution. This would be normal resolution, and this would be low resolution. The software automatically is going to adjust your scan time and your settings to correspond with your selections. Typically in my practice, what I do is, is I, I recommend for myself and for other clinicians, depending upon what type of scanner you have, scanning patients at either 0.3 or 0.4 millimeter voxel size. Models, prostheses or prosthesis, dentures, etc. Uh, I recommend scanning at the highest possible resolution that your comb beam scanner permits. Why is that? Well, it's because you don't necessarily have to worry about radiation dose to your model, and you do have to worry about that for your patient. And then also what's important is, is, is that when you start increasing the resolution of your scan, you also have to start thinking about your patient artifact error. As mentioned before, minimizing double movements or movement effects or ghosting on a comb beam image is a big deal. You can see here that this is a ghosted image, this little outline right in here versus this right in here is a clear image. Certainly within my practice, I treat a tremendous amount of older patients. And so using a comb beam scanner and sitting still or standing still for an extended period of time is somewhat of a challenge for my patient. And what happens there is, is that if I can go ahead and scan a patient that has a little trouble holding still, if it can be done a little bit faster and it's just a little bit lower resolution, but it makes for a much cleaner scan, I'm going to get a better outcome with my implant procedure. In this particular case, are you really gaining that much by going from 0.4 to 0.3 millimeter voxel size or 0.3 to 0.2 on your scanner? 
Yes, you are, but is it clinically significant? I make an argument that it's not. The metal artifact removal algorithm is something that is not available in every combium scanner, but it's available with most combium scanners. Many artifact errors can be eliminated by choosing the metal artifact removal setting within your combium scanner. Other scanners call this different things, but essentially it's a software computerized algorithm that's going to interpret the scan and digitally adjust the scan based upon the settings within scan software to correct for something called beam hardening. Beam hardening is that little scatter effect that comes from the comb beam. So as a photon hits a metal artifact, it causes that scattering or that kind of starry, starry night appearance within your scans. This metal artifact removal will greatly enhance your ability in challenging cases to align multiple scans. But do be careful. Not all scanners are created equal. I can tell you that my scanner, uh, I do have a Vatex scanner. It works extremely well. It does have this. Uh, also, the CareStream scanners that's available on the Blue Sky Bio website has an extensive array of different settings and incredible functions within that Comium scanner. It's a fabulous scanner. So also, how we begin with proper imaging is very important. We have to make sure our patients are lined up correctly. Minimizing the post-processing effects of our comb beam scan is going to greatly enhance our workflows. Making sure that our patients are, are aligned to their midline is very important. The patient should be slumping their shoulders. We want to make sure that there's no chance for that image or that machine to bump into the patient's shoulders. And now this right here is actually a little bit of an older image for me. It's my old comb beam scanner. During those comb beam scans, I would have the patient wear one of these lead shields. With my newer comb beam scanner, it's such a low, low radiation dose, I've essentially eliminated the use of that lead shield. Now that's completely up to you, even though if I do have a patient that asks, could I wear it? I do have one available, of course, but I recommend in my own hands, I do not like to go ahead and have that stuff while during the, the scan. The radiation dose is controlled. It's targeted to the head and neck, and most of those lead shields, historically, in my experience, just get in the way of my imaging. Second of all, I recommend lining up your horizontal red line with the desired arch tooth CEJ position. Contrary to what we would do with a panoramic image, my assistants know that that horizontal line is going to be in alignment with right around the tooth CEJs or possibly the occlusal surface of my desired arch. Now with a panoramic, that horizontal line is meant to line up for Frankfurt horizontal. But with comb beam imaging, at least with my scanner, it's meant to go ahead and give you the center of where the comb beam scan is going to be. Depending upon what algorithm you have set, if you have it set for making a quadrant scan, you have to use generic set values. But for my scans, when I make them at 12 by 9, that perfectly positions them so that way my desired arch is right in the focal plane or the center of my comb beam image. Now, if it does happen where my patient is slightly out of that horizontal, uh, most comb beam softwares, Blue Sky Plane included, uh, will allow you to reorient the patient. It's important that you understand when this occurs in the Blue Sky Plan software. When you import your DICOMs, you're making that change right here with those little blue orbs. Taking a look here, this little circle here is going to change how the insertion access of your patient's potential surgical guide is going to be, not to mention the orientation of your patient. So typically when I have these scans imported, I want to make sure that the patient's occlusal arch is horizontal to this bottom plane right here or to this yellow line right here. Same thing right in here. I want to make sure that this occlusal plane is in line with this flat part of the yellow line or the bottom part of the screen. Over here, it's not as critical. However, if you have a little bit of a yaw correction, a side-to-side -side motion, uh, then I do like to make that change. But this is something that I do in 100% of my scans. I want to make sure that they're perfectly aligned so that way it makes for registration simplicity for me. The last thing you want to do is, is go through an hour of treatment planning and you have a huge case design in Blue Skype plan. And then all of a sudden you click to make the surgical guide and then something might not work properly. I encourage you to check that out from the beginning. Very importantly, I want to avoid patient movement error. Now, you can see here, as I mentioned before, 
you can see the double image. This is a ghosting image where the patient moved just ever so slight. And now movement can occur in kind of the, the macro dimension, meaning the patient kind of moves their head around or the combing machine bumps into the back of them. Now that can be avoided. However, the other one that's tricky to understand is, is, is that as the patient breathes in and out, or maybe they try to hold their breath and they get to 15 seconds and then it's just not enough to make the scan and they go, that causes their mandible to deviate ever so slightly. And if you're doing a scan for a mandible, that could be a problem. So you always want the patient to breathe normally, do a test run on your comb beam scanner to make sure that you don't get any movement or potential artifact. Now, minimizing background noise and scatter is a little bit uh, trickier, but I'll show you some techniques in a video that will help with this. Now, the question that comes up is, is that should I have the patient in occlusion or with an open bite? Showing you here, these are two different patient scans, and you can see the clarity and the cleanliness of both of these scans. Now, yes, the patient on the right has less metal and less other restorations to cause beam hardening scattering effects. However, what I can tell you is, is, is that I almost 100% of the time recommend for an open bite comb beam image. And the reason for that is, is it creates a very nice visual structure for me to align study models or to align possible working models for a surgical guide plan. By being able to see the dentition clearly greatly facilitates my comb beam imaging and my surgical guide planning. Now, let's also figure out and imagine what makes an ideal scan. Now, a non-ideal scan, in my opinion, is like you see here on the left. It's somebody that has their teeth in occlusion and really nothing in regards to the proper isolation, what we would do for a patient. Now, what do you mean, Mike? Isolation. Take a look at the scan on the right. I've got a patient with an open bite and you can see the patient's dentition clearly. The tongue is also away from the patient's dentition. So let's go ahead and introduce that concept because I'm a firm believer in something called the soft tissue isolation technique for comb beam imaging. You can see here on the left and on the right, two different types of scans. On the left is our everyday typical comb beam scan, either sent to an imaging center, a radiologist would take or a technician in, a, in an imaging center would take a scan looks just like this. Are you gaining a lots of information from that scan? Well, absolutely. It's your status quo. It is your everyday scan. However, shown here on the right hand side where that green is, this is my everyday recommended scan, what I do in my practice. I have slight soft tissue separation of the lips to the dentition. Also, the patient's tongue is away from the roof of their mouth. Now, in this particular scan, we made an image or comb beam scan of this patient for the purposes of a maxillary implant case. Very importantly, it allows me to directly visually see that patient and their dentition or the potential edentulous site. Now, what you're essentially doing is, is you're leveraging the technology of comb beam imaging by introducing airspace around the oral structures. As we know, the oral structures and the bone have a very high Hounsfield units radio density measurement, where airspace has a very low, typically negative 1,000 Hounsfield units. Cortical bone, maybe what, around 1,000 Hounsfield units, potentially more. What we know is, is, is that you can see those clearly differentiating between that and the lips. But what happens is, is that the tongue and portions of teeth have a very similar radio density. And if I can go ahead and create an air pocket around similar structures, it allows me to see the dentition or other structures very simply. Now, here's another question. When do we need the patients in occlusion? So the only time I really recommend comb beam scans when the patient is in occlusion is if you're doing these full arch immediate load cases with a stackable guide and or a CAD cam interim prosthesis. Now, why would you need the patient in occlusion for this? Well, it's very important as part of the workflow to be using the patient in a proper occlusion. If you don't, you might throw off some of the nature of how you're designing these cases. You could potentially work around it depending upon how creative you are with comb beam imaging. However, in my practice, this is not what I do every day. My everyday is pretty simple dentistry mixed in with some in-plane overdentures, and I do a fair number of full arch cases. However, 
when it comes down to it, this is the indication of where we would want to go ahead and make sure that our patient's still in occlusion. However, for the vast majority of scans, out of occlusion is ideal. Now, how do we manage that? How would we take a patient out of occlusion and how would we create an air pocket around our patient's dentition? By taking simple cotton rolls, take a series of cotton rolls, pack them buckle and lingual around where the cheeks and the soft tissue are for the tongue. And what's going to happen is, is we can take our image and you'll see when I start to go through radiological slices of this patient, you see the roll of the cotton roll sufficiently around the patient's dentition. The tongue is away from that patient's arch. Now you can see the mandibular structures easily all the way around. You can see the gingiva. You can see the oral structures clearly defined. And then additionally, you can see even when this patient has an extensive amount of restorations in their mouth, it greatly enhances my ability to align STL files from optical scans or from a comb beam scan of that patient's model. And interestingly enough, I was always trained in dental school that comb beam imaging is for hard tissue. However, it's clearly evident in today's technology that we can see soft tissues on our comb beam scan. And if we can leverage that capacity, if I can go ahead and toy with the radio density or the thresholding, the little slider at the bottom of the Blue Sky Plan software, that will allow me to see my patient structure, whether it is hard tissue or soft tissue. Now, another way that we can do that is, is there was no hard and fast rule saying that you can't have the patient comb beam scan while wearing cheek retractors. So now, yes, you wouldn't want to use metal cheek retractors, but you can use plastic cheek retractors. You can use plastic cheek retractors, a, a tongue depressor for them to bite down on. You can be extremely creative with how you manage the patient's soft tissue during the scan. So typically what I do in my practice is something much simpler. I love these little opture gates. I have no financial relationship with Ivocar. I just like them. They're simple. They're slick. They're easy. I use them as part of my intraoral scan when I generate the images for my patient. And then they stay in the mouth. They go back. The patient goes back to the CBCT imaging center or into the back of my practice. And we place a couple of cotton rolls or just have the patient bite down on the little bite stick that the comb beam has. And it does two at the same time. And then on the lingual space, I have the patient just keep their tongue in the center of their mouth, away from the roof of their mouth and away from their mandibular dentition. In this video, I'm going to show you how to go ahead and simply get the patient set up for comb beam imaging with soft tissue isolation. By doing this, all I'm going to do is take a series of cotton rolls and I'm just going to go ahead and pack it in on the buckle and lingual. And you can see here that my patient's heavily restored. This patient had crown and bridge dentistry from 1965 done, done at the University of Southern California by one of uh, kind of the very interesting professors down at the time, Alex Coper. This happens to be my father-in-law. So we keep an eye on his teeth. Um, he's heavily restored. So a classic type of patient where you would have challenges making a comb beam scan and overlaying multiple scans together. So if I'm doing a maxillary scan, all I need is those three cotton rolls on the buckle, two on the occlusal. And now my patient's ready for comb beam imaging. And I'm going to kind of jump forward a little bit here. And you can see how that looks like in his mouth. Patient will also have the tongue away from his roof of his mouth. If you're doing a mandibular scan, that's what you would look like. Three on the buckle, two on the lingual. So that way you can keep the tongue away. And then additionally, this last section will show you if I'm going to be doing upper and lower. I would use a series of cotton rolls. And I would just combine the upper and lower. And this last step is to show you using the opture gate. By using the opture gate, just going to slide that into the patient's mouth, squeezing from the sides and squeezing from the top and bottom, popping that in, making for very effective soft tissue separation. And then you would combine that with a couple of cotton rolls, or you can have the patient bite down on the little bite stick. Furthermore, when I take the patient back to the imaging area of my practice, or if I have my assistant do this procedure, then I would get ready for the comb beam scan, use whatever sort of isolation or lead shield if I indicated for this particular patient, set them up in the comb beam scanner, and I won't go through this whole video. So just showing you a little video, so the step-by-step -step of how to do a comb beam. 
I'm going to align my patient. Since I'm doing a maxillary implant for my father-in-law, I'm going to align this horizontal arrow here right in line, right around with the CEJs or with the, uh, the teeth of the maxillary arch. That midline is in alignment with the patient's midline as well. It'll go through the spinning functions, and then I just have the patient spit out their cotton rolls, and then we're done. Not very difficult. You know, it's pretty funny because a lot of people see this and they think, wow, that seems very complex, Mike. When all reality, it's just cotton rolls. Um, you can use plastic cheek retractors, regardless what you do, it allows you to be creative. And what happens with this is, is when you start thinking about your scanning differently, it allows you to think outside of the enamel box. Because if I take these really difficult cases that are hard to do with complex alignment of different techniques, it allows me to say, you know what? I'm going to place some cotton rolls around my patient's denture. And many of us may or may not know it. If you'd use the soft tissue separation technique, you could see the outline of the patient's denture in 360 degrees and also in your slices. By doing that, it allows us to leverage the technology. So instead of having to use barium sulfate, duplicating the patient's models or dentures, putting gutta percha points in, all of that technology is perfectly fine. But if I can do that in a way where I don't need two visits or I don't need to modify the patient's denture, I just literally put in cotton rolls or cheek retractors, you can leverage your comb beam technology and your software to be able to see the denture in 360 degrees just with photons, no optical images for this particular scan. Think of the possibilities of what you can do with alignment, with treatment planning, with potential prostheses. If you can do a slice within your comb beam software to be able to see this functionality right here, it's incredible. And that's something that, that I've thought of for some time. And, and I developed a technique where I use a radiographic poly uh, vinyl siloxane impression reline material. I'll reline the patient's denture. And then what we do is, is we take that into our blue sky plan software. I have two scans. I have a cone beam scan of the patient wearing this denture with the reline radio opaque PBS. And then I have a cone beam scan of the radio opaque PBS. You do not need any sort of optical scan for the step um, in the blue sky plan software, because I can take that PBS impression and I'm going to align the scan of the cone beam of the denture to the patient's cone beam scan itself. Then I can use the Ferguson method, invert the PBS impression material and generate that soft tissue model that you see. And it's aligned perfectly. Frankly, I've been doing this technique for years. And then when Blue Sky Plan came out with this functionality, I was so floored. I said, holy cow, this is incredible. No other software allows you to do this. No other software allows you to do it with such ease and functionality and power as the Blue Sky Plan software. And working on these extremely challenging cases allows me to take a patient with a denture or with a partial, reline it with a radio opaque PBS, then use the anatomical markers that are in that radio opaque PBS, that line that you see, this white line right here, and all of these little markers that you see on the scan, I can then very simply create a Blue Sky Bio fully guided surgical kit, kit and place max implants, place internal hex implants efficiently and effectively. Wow. If this was just available in comb beam imaging software five years ago, where would we be these days in implant dentistry? Things are evolving so quick from a day-to-day -day basis, but this technology allows us to leverage the possibilities. And I can tell you that the only limitation of being able to work with these challenging cases is using your mind. That is the most important hardware and software that we have. So then I can take that patient, generate a surgical guide, run it through my sterilization protocol, place a series of implants with simplicity. By being able to leverage that technology, yes, I could just go ahead and freehand place four implants in the anterior mandible for this overdenture case. But if I can place implants in the 19 and 30 position, along with the 22 and 27 position, it allows me to create incredible results exceeding expectations of my patients instead of just delivering status quo. And if you can make a restoration that looks and feels like this, this is my every day in my practice. And I can tell you after doing this for years and years and years, patients love these types of overdentures. So now the question comes up is, is what are some simple steps 
for successful model registration for even complex cases. Here's a case that I'm working up right now. I think I scanned her Monday here in my office. I said, shoot, this would be a great case to show in the, um, uh, in the webinar here on Wednesday. Perfect. She's pretty heavily restored. There's lots of zirconia crowns everywhere, lots of PFM, you know, metal restorations, endo, lots of potential for scattering. Now here's my scan. You can see here on the right-hand side of the screen, I've got an open bite CBCT. And even with an open bite, it's challenging to look at this case and how are we going to align that? Now let's look at this. Our classic approach of registering STL and CBCT is very, very seemingly simple. And yes, Blue Sky Plan makes this so simple. However, there's a lot of effort that goes into this step. Because for me, in my experience, aligning the scans often takes more time than actually designing the implant and surgical guide itself. Blue Sky Plan is an extremely versatile software, and it provides the most control in any combeam imaging software on the planet. However, one thing to understand is, is that alignment can be the limiting linchpin of our procedures. As I talked about last year during my webinar of where we can avoid rookie mistakes, one is so critical, avoiding misalignment of your optical scan or of your secondary scan to your patient scan. And the research shows that between a half millimeter to 0.6 millimeters of error of your implant position can be attributed to misalignment. And additionally, you throw in patients with extensive metal-based restorations, it can add a quarter of a millimeter to that number above. So some classic workarounds of what have been used to align challenging cases are what you see here on the screen. Radiopaque markers, sure beads, any, you know, using these technologies. I mean, heck, even having a patient wear a PBS impression with these markers in their mouth, which to tell you the truth, I've tried it. It's crazy. I, I, I can't imagine putting a patient through that on a regular basis. However, quite a few clinicians do that and have good results. So nothing against that. It's just not an efficient workflow for me. Or potentially taking a cone beam scan of the patient's denture with barium sulfate, doing a radial pate guide with gut aperture points. Are, are all these techniques effective? Absolutely. Do they still work? You better believe they work. Can they be really good? Absolutely. However, in my practice, it's a little bit cumbersome of a workflow. I like to skip most of this step. And the reason for that is, is I really like the KISS rule, even with these challenging cases. Because let's take a look here. What is going to allow us to align this patient? Even though you think I need a fiduciary marker, a way of aligning two scans together to be spherical in nature, like a gutter percha point or a sure mark marker, Everything you see here on the screen is a fiduciary marker. This cusp tip, this CEJ, this little bump of the soft tissue here, this little concavity of the lingual palatal soft tissue, this area of the frenum are all places we can align the scan to. So if I take my comb beam scan and literally think I'm going to join the picture of that tooth, that allows us to leverage that technology. So if I take my patient from before and we work up her case, if I go step by step, we're going to bring in her scan and you can see there's a fair amount of scatter, but I'm going to investigate the scan, make sure I'm in alignment, correct my occlusal plane back and forth, make sure that I'm parallel to that bottom portion of the screen, correct for a little bit of yaw position if indicated. I've got a tremendous amount of scatter on this scan. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in her comb beam and I'm going to align it with her scan. For these really challenging cases, I skip that initial alignment and I go right to the model manipulation tab, choose the arch and click on points for my alignment because it allows me to create a surface model of the patient's comb beam scan. And even in the most challenging of cases, you can find little parts of teeth, cusps, marginal ridges that you can get really close, meaning that on the distal of number two, there's a little marginal ridge that I can align this patient to. So I'm going to take and look back and forth and say, well, can I see that distal buccal cusp? Can I see the mesial buccal cusp? Absolutely. 
Looking here at the canine, do I see a little spot here on the canine? Absolutely, those two are similar. You're looking, even in challenging cases, you're going to find tiny little anatomical markers and structures where you can effectively align scans to. Lingual cusps make it simple. And now one thing that's tricky and hard to figure out is that sometimes you have to turn on and off that refine with ICP button. So even though ICP is an iterative closest point algorithm, it works fantastic in most cases. In really challenging cases with a lot of scatter, I find it sometimes very effective to turn off that little checkbox in the points registration module. Now here's the magic of the soft tissue separation technique. Even though I've got a challenging case, what I do is I turn on my panoramic curve and I make my yellow line as wide as I possibly can. That's going to bring in more data into my scan. So as I go into a sagittal slice, take a look. You're looking at the palate. You're looking at the gingiva. You're looking at your scan of the patient's arch, making sure that you see that yellow line or any color line of the model in alignment. You're verifying that you can see those rugae, the gingival structures on the facial, where that cotton roll is. And you can see here, cotton rolls right there in alignment, making this really simple and straightforward. I can then correct very small changes using my adjust manual position. And even if I'm a little hair off, it allows me to say, you know what? There's where the palate is. There's where the gingiva is. I can then look at the soft tissue around my edentulous site and align these with precision and easily and effectively. Then I'm going to go into my axial slice. In my axial slice, if I blow it up big, I'm going to look at those dimensions in all capacities, looking at where those lines are, looking at the areas on the outside part of the arch to make sure that that area of the soft tissue or this little arc of the palate is in alignment with my blue sky plan. Once I go ahead and do that, I can easily add my max implant here or whatever blue sky bio implant you choose to use and then get it ready for my implant procedure and surgical guide. So this workflow I use over and over again. And the key here is, is, is that when you do this workflow, when I generate a PVS model uh, or PVS impression or an alginate and then make a stone model of this patient, I want to make sure I pick up the entire palate on the maxilla. On the mandible, I want to make sure I pick up the entire mandibular structure. I want something that's a little bit uh, overextended. An alginate as an impression material is classically going to push tissues out of the way and make them overextended. Additionally, if I'm using intraoral scanning, you saw for my intraoral scan, I scanned her entire palate. Even though you think, well, shoot, I'm just going to go ahead and scan the arch just to make it simple. I always want to pick up these palatal rugae while I scan. And frankly, my intraoral scanner makes it very simple to pick up the palate. So I do that. So that way I have lots and lots of markers for me to align to. So here's a case. Literally, I saw this lady for a follow-up today before jumping here on the webinar. One of the more tough cases that I do on a regular basis in my office, but pretty routine for me. Patient with a maxillary complete denture, failing mandibular dentition. Um, she's approximately 87 years old, somewhere in that range, 85 to 87. Heavily restored on the mandible and also wearing a partial. We don't have the ability to go ahead and, you know, have a lot of wiggle room for these cases because our plan here is to place four implants for an overdenture. So for her, what I did was, is I just literally made an intraoral scan of her mandibular arch and let's align that. So when she said, when can I get started with implant dentistry? I said, how about right now? Uh, I made an intraoral scan of her mandibular arch, no radiopaque PVS, just literally a straight impression in her mouth. I then had the patient go back to my uh, comb beam machine. My assistant made the comb beam using cotton roll separation. And then I took my intraoral scan using that same method that I showed you with that last patient. And I overlaid that patient's scan. Was this an easy one? Far from it. It took me quite a little you know, effort back and forth. But by looking at that soft tissue separation, I can see that yellow line traversing over that soft tissue ridge in the posterior. And I do not have any anatomical landmarks in the anterior or posterior for me to rely upon other than soft tissue. There's just too much scatter from the radiograph. However, in the axial mode, the sagittal mode, I can easily see that I've aligned my soft tissue scan properly. 
Then in my mesh mixer software, did a, a virtual extraction. And then I'm gonna go ahead and use that last canine as a way of supporting my surgical guide. Then generate my surgical guide in blue sky plan just for those four implants. And that's what my surgical guide looked like. 3D printed it. And then I went to the surgery. Uh, all the teeth came out except for that canine. And then I placed, these are internal hex blue sky bio implants, placed four implants in the anterior mandible efficiently and very predictably. And ultimately, this is where I ended up with this patient, just standard locator overdenture case. However, this patient is extremely happy with this result, exceeding the patient's expectations, which she was always told by multiple other providers that she only has enough bone for two implants. However, the routine in my practice is now to at least place four implants on the mandible and between four and six on the maxilla. So to finalize this presentation, couple of take home points for working with these challenging cases and enhancing our ability for alignment success. First and foremost, make sure our model or our intraoral scan or our cone beam scan of the patient's scan has all of the necessary landmarks, meaning teeth, gingiva, palate, tori. You saw that one patient with that massive mandibular tori just a, a few slides ago. I have used tori all over the all over the place as a effective way of verifying alignment of my scans. Tori, retromolar pads, uh, little bumps of soft tissue allow me to align multiple scans easily. Then Whenever we're working with scans, especially coming out of a cone beam or out of an intraoral scan, we want to try to minimize cropping of that soft tissue before alignment. Even if we can't make an intraoral scan or, a, pardon me, a surgical guide off of a, an optical scan um, because there's too much soft tissue in the way, I will first align my model that has all of that pertinent structure on there. Then I will bring in a cleaned up model and align it using the Blue Sky Bio soft tissue alignment features, or I'll just align it using anatomical landmarks. And many times if it's the same STL file, it'll automatically align easily. Then additionally, you want to quote, find a few good teeth and start there. Even in heavily restored cases, you're going to be able to find little portions of teeth that you can align to, whether it's a mesial buccal cusp, distal marginal ridge, et cetera. And then furthermore, you, because of the soft tissue separation and the occlusal separation, you're going to verify your alignment using the palate and gingiva, retromolar pads, tori, et cetera. And as a take home, follow the KISS rule. Keep it simple use very effective, creative, outside of the box concepts to make your everyday implant life easy. And finally, if you have any questions or need some additional training for any of this, I cover this extensively in my in-person and online courses, FastTrackDentalCE.com. Um, we run a completely online course with CE credits provided by UNLV School of Dental Medicine, approximately 30 hours of video step-by-step -step education, and a couple of the videos that you saw in here are included in that online course. And in our in-person courses here in California, we cover an extensive amount of step-by-step -step instruction and certainly highlighting the Blue Sky Bio method, uh, generating surgical guides. And certainly I thank everybody for tuning in here. Um, and I'm happy to go ahead and take some questions, Michael, if we had any questions from our uh, viewers. Okay. Um, yeah, everybody's encouraged to type in any questions that you might have while we're waiting for that. I'll just uh, remind everybody again to enter your details into that attendance form so that we could send you uh, the CE credit. The CE credit should come via email within around a week of the presentation. Um, as you mentioned, I th you know, I think this is an extremely important topic as the, the backbone really of treatment planning and surgical guides is a proper CT scan and the proper alignment. And without tackling that properly and without addressing it properly, then you're just starting on the wrong foot and you'll have uh, problematic results. So I think it's an amazing presentation that you gave and the comments are coming in as well. Um, thank you for a great presentation, amazing presentation, great presentation. So, you know, I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank you for outlining these important points and really simplifying it make it as straightforward as possible absolutely and thank you michael for allowing me to present and being able to just provide some information i know that makes my everyday <laughs> life easier and 
many of the things that I've learned have been the hard way when, you know, I don't get an ideal scan and I have to be very creative to work around it. But then I start to realize that um, it's sometimes nice just to have the good starting point because then, you know, I can get done with the surgical guide plan much faster. So ultimately it's about keeping that same level of reliability, but to do it easily, effectively, um, and just as well. Okay, so this presentation is being recorded and it'll be available via the Blue Sky Plan website and available via YouTube. So I definitely encourage to forward it and, and share it. Um, and Dr. Scherer's email address is on the screen. As he mentioned, he's willing to take questions via email. And we have additional educational information as well on Blue Sky Plan as uh, we do regarding upcoming presentations. So. I'd like to thank everybody for attending the presentation. And Dr. Scherer, once again, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, putting this presentation together and sharing it with all of us. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you for the opportunity.